Welcome everyone to Brian Lehrer Live 2007. We are here live Wednesday nights at 7.30 again this year. And tonight we begin a new series for 2007 called Earth to New York. Part one tonight, Ethiopia to New York. This comes at a time when Ethiopia and the United States are both fighting Al-Qaeda in Somalia and Oxfam and Starbucks have released dueling videos about living conditions for Ethiopian coffee farmers. We'll show you those videos and we'll update the Sean, Sh Sean Bell shooting investigation tonight and take your calls on the Sean Bell case. But first, we've been checking out web video and here are two things you may find interesting. Number one, you know about the cell phone video of Saddam Hussein's hanging and you've seen it if you wanted to, but the hanging itself has also spawned a generation of hanging video mashups and satire, some in fairly good taste, some not so. We chose one video from YouTube to represent the new user-generated world where even something as solemn as an execution can be anyone's media Lego plaything. So somebody took the real audio from the execution and those Lego characters and mashed them up and this is getting thousands of hits on the web. This is kind of the kind of thing people are watching today. By the way, Saddam, your execution may have been botched by the thuggish new Shiite government, but may you rot in hell for your genocidal murder. On a lighter note, believe it or not, the first debate in the 2008 presidential campaign has now been set for April 26, 2007. That's right, April 26th of this year. And candidates are already beginning to use the web to go over the heads of the mainstream media right to you, the voters. We found this video posted by Democratic hopeful John Edwards. I've come to the personal conclusion that I actually want the country to see who I am, who I really am. But I don't know what the result of that will be. But for me personally, I'd rather be successful or unsuccessful based on who I really am, not based on some plastic Ken doll that you put up in front of audiences. I, that's not me, you know. We'll keep an eye on how all the presidential hopefuls are using the web. Can't believe I'm saying this, but I guess our 2008 campaign coverage has officially just begun. What day is it? Now, as I said before, we begin a new series tonight called Earth to New York. In each episode of this series, we will check out reality in one nation on Earth that's been in the news or should be in the news, and also check out the local community from that nation since New York has people from everywhere on Earth. We begin this series with part one, Ethiopia to New York. Now, Ethiopia is in the news this week for two reasons. Ethiopian troops and U.S. warplanes have both been fighting Al-Qaeda in Somalia, and because Starbucks and Oxfam have released dueling videos onto the web about how Starbucks treats Ethiopian coffee growers. Let's begin right there. Oxfam, the global relief and development organization, fired the first video shot. Here it is. We're down here in Seattle, the home of Starbucks Coffee. Starbucks to honor their commitment to Ethiopian coffee farmers. Ethiopia is the birthplace of coffee and millions of people depend on it for their livelihood. Some of the world's finest coffees come from Ethiopia. Ethiopian farmers receive an average of three cents per cup of coffee that Starbucks sells. People are speaking out today in countries all over the world, in cities all over the world, including London, Sydney, Australia, Addis Ababa, and Germany and Ireland and here in Seattle. We are Ethiopian Americans and we fully support Ethiopia's step to trademark its coffee name. Yes, I think it's awful they only get three cents. I think they should get more than three cents. They should give them better prices and more money. We got together local fair trade activists and people from the Ethiopian community that are in support of improving the livelihood of Ethiopians. You know, 
in one of the poorest countries in the world. I would urge Starbucks to respect this project and to help pass more profits down to Ethiopian farmers. It's a great idea. Some people are walking by and they, they see the sign that says only three cents is going to the farmer. They don't realize that at the beginning of the supply chain, there's people that are getting almost nothing. Three cents is, is beyond an insult. The names are rightfully theirs and it's not up to Starbucks to stop the Ethiopians from having the opportunity to improve their, their way of life. Starbucks did not take that video lying down, but rather than work through old media TV, Starbucks released its response video directly onto YouTube. For us to do what we've been asked to do, which is sign a licensing agreement, recognizing their trademark right names of their geographies, is something that's against the law. U.S. law does have uh, an allowance for this. It's a specific allowance called certification. And we have proposed this as an alternative. We are very committed uh, to finding a solution with the Ethiopian government because it is in the best interest of the coffee farmers. We pay more than fairly. We pay sometimes multiples of the commodity price and uh, in the past two years we paid over the fair trade pricing average. But again, we're trying to make sure that these farmers are in business. We're not trying to see what we can save on procuring green coffee. In Ethiopia, for example, we have invested more than 2.4 million dollars in the last few years just in social development projects, trying to help farmers improve their lives in the communities that grow our coffee. Uh, we've done water projects, we've built schools and libraries. Uh, so all of these are also part of the price that that we invest in these communities to make sure we continue to get the coffees that we're looking for. Is that guy's name really Dub Hay? So we've seen Oxfam's pointed jacuz and Starbucks talking head reply. It's Ethiopia to New York on Brian Lehrer Live tonight. Let's learn more with Josh, Josh Ruxin, a professor of public health at Columbia University who has just arrived in New York today from Rwanda. He works with several organizations over there, including the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia and Columbia's Earth Institute. And Levin Abisa, founder and publisher of Tadius, an Ethiopian American magazine. And Tadius to you, since that means hello, doesn't it? Tadius, thank you, Brian. Thank you very much for coming. Josh, thank you very much for coming. Thanks for having um, me. Josh, you don't look at all like you're jet lagged after just <laughs> flying in from Ru Rwanda. It are must you? be that Starbucks coffee I had on my way over. Are you, was that a product placement? <laughs> are you familiar with the conditions of Ethiopian coffee growers? Uh, I'm pretty familiar with the regional conditions of coffee growers uh, in, in that part of Africa and with a lot of the work that Starbucks has been doing. So is three cents, which is what that debate was about, is that good, bad, medium by world coffee production standards? I think if you actually add up the three cents per cup and actually put it in terms of how much the farmers are receiving per pound, Starbucks actually does come out on the right side. They're spending uh, two, three, four times what the farmers are used to uh, receiving for the commodity price of just basic green coffee. Really? So you're coming down on Starbucks side here, and they do sell a lot of cups. Yeah, I, I would actually go a little bit farther to, to just be uh, a bit aggressive here and say that Starbucks has actually done a lot more for development in Ethiopia in places like Rwanda than lots of the development organizations that we usually expect to be involved in development. Right. Now, you're working very closely with development organizations. Um, if you're right, why do you think Oxfam is going on the offensive the way they are? I think companies like Starbucks, just like the pharmaceutical companies that produce antiretroviral drugs for treating HIV AIDS, are easy, low-hanging targets. Do you have uh, an opinion about this? I know you're here really to talk about the Ethiopian American community in New York. Is this a topic of discussion in the Ethiopian American community? Um, it is because, you know, as you saw in the clip, uh, coffee, I mean, Ethiopia is the birthplace of coffee. and. Uh, and the finest coffee in the world comes from Ethiopia. And coffee is an $80 billion industry, uh, making it uh, one of the most valuable uh, you know, trading uh, commodities after, um, after oil. And according to uh, Oxfam, about 15 million people in Ethiopia depend on, uh, on coffee. Um, and, you know, uh, about 40 to 60 percent of Ethiopia's exports is coffee, which is which is huge, 
and coffee buyers pay uh, about $26 per pound uh, for Ethiopian coffee, and about 5 to 10 percent of the retail value goes to the farmers. And in comparison, uh, if you look at the Jamaican Blue Mountain, another fine coffee, the farmers get about 45 uh, percent of that. So, um, yeah, it is, it is a, you know, an So you issue. think if we polled Ethiopian <coughs> coffee farmers on whether they feel exploited by Starbucks or not, they probably mostly say no? Uh, I'm not sure about exploited, but I'm sure they would like to get, you know, a fair share of... Um, Anybody would like to get as much as yeah. possible. Is this a traditional Ethiopian crop, or in the globalized economy, is this just a crop for export? No, coffee, uh, you know, the, we say that coffee originated uh, in Ethiopia, and it's very much part of uh, um, our culture, and, uh, um, and it's one of our, you know, largest exports, and it has been for, you know, for some time now. If more New Yorkers realized that coffee originated in Ethiopia, they would worship your country. <laughs> <laughs> um, so can you talk about whether this raises larger issues of the globalized economy, since that's a lot of the work that you do with Jeffrey Sachs at the Earth Institute, um, that go beyond coffee, that go beyond Ethiopia, the fact that this is a crop for export and the impact that they may have or the relationship that that might have with the chronic famine and poverty in Ethiopia? Yeah, I mean, I think the fundamental issue is one of poverty, and the question on everyone's mind is, can coffee, can other commodity crops like this possibly roll back poverty or potentially eradicate it? And I think that the answer comes out uh, resoundingly yes. If systems can be put in place, for example, better coffee washing stations, better logistics. In Rwanda, uh, a group that I work with has just introduced bicycles with uh, room on the back for putting coffee bags so that <coughs> they can get picked, the beans right after they can be picked can actually get to the washing station faster and better coffee can be delivered to the consumer. Improving the logistics chain, which is something Starbucks is extremely engaged in in Ethiopia, is something that ultimately helps to bring more of that value to the coffee growers themselves. But there's a lot of work that has to happen on the ground in order to make that happen. We invite phone calls in this segment, particularly from Ethiopian New Yorkers. If any of you happen to be in the audience right now, that would be great. Uh, I can't see our screen, but our phone number may already be up. If not, we'll put it up. It's 212-251-0801, 212-251-0801. That phone number is up. And so if you're Ethiopian American, call in and talk about any of these issues that we're raising. Talk about life as an Ethiopian American. We'll talk about the Somalia, Ethiopia situation, coffee growers, and anyone else welcome to call as well, as well 212-251-0801. Uh, Josh, I saw a news item just today from Reuters about the World Bank approving $175 million in grants just today to avoid chronic food shortages in Ethiopia. Are there chronic food shortages? Uh, there's terrible chronic food shortages. In fact, one of the reasons I first got engaged in Ethiopia dates back to 1984, the Ethiopian famine, which resulted in the Live Aid concert here. And I think when most people still think about Ethiopia, that's what they most remember. And these food shortages have been happening ever since then. Uh, a lot of the work that we're doing at the Earth Institute is focusing on creating an African green revolution by delivering better fertilizer, better seed, better agricultural techniques to the farmers who need them and doubling, tripling, even increasing their productivity by 10 and 15 fold. And so this is all extremely essential. I hope that the World Bank's financial support actually uh, is transformed into that which actually provides for sustainable means to fighting hunger in the long term. Do you think that the chronic food shortages in Ethiopia are primarily caused by natural occurrences or by human choices? I think it's both, um, you know, both uh, uh, human choices. Um, in, in the past, you know, uh, war has contributed to hu uh, food shortage in Ethiopia. And of course, uh, uh, drought is, is uh, you know, is a significant. What drugs issue. primarily? You said drugs, right? No, no, the drought. Uh, oh, drought. Yeah, so. drought and, and war and, you know, so it's both. The, uh, the, Re the Reuters article, Josh, also said this World Bank project called the Productive Safety Net Program 
helps wean families from humanitarian aid by introducing jobs programs. Is that effective in your experience? Absolutely. There's an incredible amount of idleness and underemployment in Ethiopia as well as all, all these poor countries. Uh, and there's, of course, a major burden of disease. Malaria is an enormous problem in Ethiopia, and HIV-AIDS is certainly an increasing problem as well. Um, the uh, Nobel Peace Prize this year went to Mohammed Yunus, who created the idea of microloans. I think that was originally in Bangladesh. Yes. Uh, is that applicable to Ethiopia? Is that related to the kind of thing that the World Bank is talking about with jobs programs? I, I don't know if that's actually what the World Bank is intending to do, but I think that overall Eunice's policies and approaches are ones that are highly applicable to Ethiopia and would be extremely helpful for helping the poor get out of their current situation. And what would you say about how much the chronic food shortages are the result of human choices? Well, I think if we just look at history, it shows that democracies have never suffered from famines. And, and there's something to that. I haven't had a chance to fully diagnose what all the relationships are, but certainly the Ethiopian famines of the past were, to a great degree, uh, the result of human errors, um, as well as from conflict. I think that, as was just previously mentioned, decreasing rainfall in the Horn of Africa and across Africa over the past 20 years is also a major contributing force. We had a small famine in Rwanda just this past year, and it was mainly due to the fact that there was no rain. Lieben, is Ethiopia a democracy? Uh, well, we're, we're working on it. Definitely, we're uh, very far from uh, being a democracy. Josh, what would you say? Uh, Ethiopia is not a democracy not even close by our standards. Right. Uh, what, what would you say about this? Because there's a continuum. So mm -hmm. how, how close, how far? I would say uh, over the last couple of years, there were times when it felt as though Ethiopia was coming closer towards democracy. And last year, unfortunately, there were some serious setbacks. Let's take a phone call. Andrew in Manhattan, you're on the program. Hello, Andrew. Oh, hi. Uh, actually, you sort of anticipated the question that I was going to ask, uh, which was it seems that we, we um, very often see uh, the leadership in Ethiopia sort of celebrated uh, by Western uh, organizations, by um, the UN and, and, and so forth, whereas in fact their the record on the ground in Ethiopia is, uh, Ethiopia is pretty awful, um, pretty repressive, and in fact uh, maybe worse now than it was a few years ago in the wake of the Eritrean War and, uh, and so forth. And I'm I'm wondering if maybe we're not being too, uh, uh, too soft on this leadership because they were able to topple a bad dictator and achieve some gains, and in fact we should be quite a bit uh, more demanding of them in terms of democracy. Thank you for your call. It sounds like you agree with that, Josh. Absolutely. All right. Uh, now this, um, this, the, this World Bank grant, in issuing these grants, the World Bank made a point of saying they would not be affected by Ethiopia fighting Islamists in neighboring Somalia, and of course this has been in the news. Uh, why would they even relate the two? Does conflict affect World Bank grant-making decisions? Well, I don't know exactly what plays into the calculus of the World Bank when they make grants, but uh, one thing I do know a little bit about is that the World Bank has made major grants in Ethiopia in the past, for example, for fighting HIV-AIDS, and the government of Ethiopia has had a very difficult time spending the money that they've actually received. So uh, the, the problem that the caller uh, just mentioned about transparency in the government and democracy in the government uh, is certainly one of the major challenges that the World Bank faces on the ground there. And I know that the World Bankers, although they are pressured by the U.S. and by other governments to increase the loans that they provide to Ethiopia, find spending it on the ground in a transparent way that actually reaches the poor to be extremely challenging. Now, there is this conflict in Ethiopia, really in Somalia. U.S. warplanes have just been attacking there over the last few days. But Ethiopia is very involved as well. We'll talk about that relationship as we go here. And uh, we did a little Google Earth manipulation that we'll show you now just to let you see where things are in relation to each other. So we start in lower Manhattan, we pull out, we go across the Atlantic Ocean, across Western Africa, Central Africa, to Eastern Africa. You see Ethiopia there in yellow, Somalia down to the right, Mogadishu, the capital, and we're coming into the capital of Ethiopia, Addis Ababa. Recognize any buildings there, Levin? 
It's <laughs> been a very long time. That's uh, the downtown Addis Ababa skyline, such as it is. And then back out to show you that if we head east and south, we get to Mogadishu. So these countries are obviously right near each other. There's Mogadishu, the capital of Somalia, and Ethiopia has also had uh, conflict on its other border with uh, Eritrea. But there's a little global visual context. Um, Josh, the Ethiopian troops that have recently crossed the border to fight Islamist rebels in Somalia, this has made big news in this country while you were in Africa. Mm -hmm. Why would Ethiopia care what goes on in Somalia? How does it affect them? Well, I think that the, the Google uh, Earth just showed the reasons why. Ethiopia is a landlocked country. Um, it's very important for them to have access to the sea, and one of the ways for them to get that access is through Somalia. Um, I might add, too, that regionally, Islamic fundamentalism is on the rise. There's a lot of fears in Ethiopia where half of the population is Muslim, that uh, lots of the services that traditionally might have been delivered by the Ethiopian government are now being delivered by Islamic fundamentalist groups. They're building schools, they're building health centers, and to some degree also they're indoctrinating young people with uh, some beliefs that the Ethiopian government does not share and that the U.S. government doesn't share. So Ethiopia could be the next battleground, potentially, for Islamist rebels who want to take power. I think it's certainly possible, and when you move through Ethiopia, that is one of the concerns that the average person conveys. Right. Uh, and I guess it relates back to the failure of the government to really serve the people through democracy or other means, because I guess like we've seen in many Arab countries, uh, from what you're saying, if the government is autocratic and not serving the people well, the social services and things like that, the Islamic groups rush in. Yeah, I don't think that it's fair to say, as some have suggested recently, that poverty is breeding ground for terrorism. However, at the same time, I think Ethiopia and what's going on in Somalia right now suggests that if governments choose not to fight poverty with all of the tools that are necessary, then the possibility for terrorism to actually foment within their midst does increase. All right. Now, for weeks, as we've been saying, Ethiopia has been fighting pro-Al-Qaeda rebels, rebels in neighboring Somalia. And according to the Pentagon, U.S. warplanes got involved on Sunday aiming for Al-Qaeda leaders. More than 20 people are reported dead. It's not clear if any of them were terror suspects. Here is a statement about the attacks from the president of Somalia, a U.S. ally named Abdullahi Yusuf. <laughs> So those are some of the political fault lines there. You have the actual government of Somalia led by him, along with the government of Ethiopia, fighting the al-Qaeda or pro-al-Qaeda rebels who for a while had control of the capital and apparently do not anymore. Is Ethiopia a U.S. ally? Would you characterize it that way? I think they're increasingly a U.S. ally, and the moves over the last couple of weeks suggest that they're increasingly one. I think if we just look at our aid policy over the past several years uh, with the Prime Minister Mel Sinawi in, in power, we have try to put larger and larger investments, many of those investments I might add in the area of health and HIV AIDS and clean water into Ethiopia. So I think we do consider them to be a critical ally in that part of the world. Lieben, would you say there's a lot of pro-U.S. feeling in Ethiopia or anti or mixed? Um, you know, I'm not really, I, I haven't been, um, I'm an Ethiopian American lifestyle and business magazine publisher. <laughs> uh, and I haven't been in the country. Uh, How about among the Ethiopian uh, American community members? Is there much talk about the global situation and Al Qaeda and U.S. role in the world and U.S. role in their country? 
Um, I'm sure, and, and there is, you know, diverse views within the community because the community, the Ethiopian community is very, very diverse. Uh, but in my line of work, um, I it's usually... It's not what you're focusing on. That's not what I focus okay, on. Okay, well, we'll come <laughs> back to, to stuff that you are focusing on in a bit. But Amina in Parkchester in the Bronx. Hi, you're on the program. Thanks for calling. Hi, thank you for the show. I'm, I appreciate your coverage uh, to that region. It's very important right now. Thank you. I was just uh, wondering, you know, if Ethiopia is not a democratic country, what kind of uh, support, I mean, what does it have, uh, the impact it has on this uh, so-called new government right now? I mean, what are they going to do in Somalia? I mean, first of all, to invade the country is, is against the law, the international law, and uh, it's something very, very sad. And, but this country has been on the war for almost 16 years now. I personally lived in Somalia. I have been to Ethiopia, and I can tell you it's not a democracy. It wasn't there, and it's not now. And I don't think they're supporting any democratic government, and I'm really very skeptical about this new Somali uh, government. And it's just a big sad story. Very sorry for the people who are losing their life for no reasons, you know. Who are the good guys? If the current Somali government... There's no good guys that I can really tell you. Yeah. The Islamists were not, but at least the country was in a peaceful situation, and I would prefer the Somali people to make the decision to get rid of those Islamists. Personally, I was against them because of their rules. I don't allow. I don't really accept. But I would love to leave that for the Somali people, no other uh, foreign countries. Amina, thank you very much. Josh, you want to react to that? My quick reaction is that I'm not sure that the Somali people on their own were capable of overthrowing the Islamists who were in power at the time. If they had had that opportunity, they probably would have taken it. But I think one thing that's important to take a look at is how all this is interconnected. It was back in the early 1990s when the U.S. lost a number of soldiers, I think the number was 18, in Somalia. We pulled out, and it was within a year or so of that that the genocide broke out in Rwanda, where we chose not to intervene. And so I think that there's a history in that part of the continent of choosing to intervene or not to intervene, and there have been great ramifications to those actions uh, for good and for bad. And right now, I think the choice of the Ethiopians and of the Americans was this is time to intervene. J.O. in Manhattan, you're on the air. Hello. Hello. Um, I have a question. Uh, we read that um, I believe Ethiopia is about 60% Muslim, 40% Christian, and I read a lot about the Muslims becoming radicalized because of poverty and repression. And I haven't heard anything about the Christian population, the minority, becoming radicalized as well under the same conditions. Um, is, is there any explanation for that? Josh? I don't personally have a good explanation for that. Um, I, I think that uh, in general, a lot of the leadership posts have tended to be with the uh, Christians, um, but I'm not sure if that has actually played a major role in radicalization. Well, we talked about mm -hmm. the chronic poverty and food shortages in Ethiopia. Are they weighted toward the Muslim population? If I were to ask you who does well in Ethiopia, would the answer be largely the Christian community, or doesn't it break down that I, way? I don't think that it breaks down that way, because if uh, I look at some of the work that we're doing in Ethiopia in a place called Kararo, about half of the population is Christian, about half is Muslim, and they work together in the community on agricultural interventions and health interventions together. So I don't think that there is that type of differential in who's receiving help. So, Lieben, there is an Ethiopian-American community in New York. Mm -hmm. How many Ethiopians live here? Well, we don't have an accurate number, but according to the last U.S. Uh, uh, census, uh, Ethiopians rank as one of the top three uh, largest African uh, population um, in the United States. And according to the Brookings uh, Institution, 40 percent of African-born uh, population in America reside in four states, Maryland, Texas, California, and New York. Um, and your magazine is a business and lifestyle magazine a, yeah. for all those immigrants all over the country. All over the country, and but uh, and African-born residents yes. uh, in the U.S. are highly educated, urbanized, and have one of the highest per capita incomes uh, with other uh, from other uh, 
immigrant groups. Right. And would, would Ethiopian New Yorkers tend to work in certain jobs or professions? Yeah, and so the Ethiopian population in New York mirrors that national uh, statistics, and the Ethiopian Americans in New York are professionally very diverse. Uh, we have lawyers, we have investment bankers, uh, we have people in the fashion industry, uh, supermodels, we have artists, uh, we have uh, Publishers, of course. There's no, <laughs> there's no little Ethiopia, no real Ethiopian neighborhood, is there? Uh, in, in in America, there is. Uh, Los Angeles has little Ethiopia, oh. and actually one of the first uh, uh, neighborhoods named after an African country, I think. Um, and there is also a movement in Washington D.C. because Washington D.C., Maryland. Virginia area is one of the largest Ethiopian population outside of Ethiopia. Probably. When I was in Minneapolis, Minnesota, I was surprised to see a big Ethiopian restaurant right downtown. Are there many Ethiopians in the upper Midwest? Yes, uh, there is. A, a, you know, there are pockets of large Ethiopian population, and, and as you said, in Minnesota and Los Angeles, yeah. Atlanta. Um, now that and, must and be also. a shock to move from Ethiopia to Minnesota. Maybe the weather. <laughs> exactly. What about uh, New York? But in New York, um, as I said, you know, professionally we're very diverse. Uh, but you know, New York also being New York, you know, so it's a tough city, so it's dynamic, but it's very expensive. So the uh, Ethiopians in New York tend to be highly educated, um, and uh, they're educated and, and professional group. But there is uh, and uh, a large. A group of Ethiopians are now sort of, you know, moving into um, uptown Harlem area. As well. Northern Harlem. Northern Harlem. 160th Street around. There. I, I would say anywhere between, you know, 145 to yeah. You know, I, I read an article that said that this is a problem for Ethiopians trying to uh, acculturate to the United States when they come here. The fact that there's no central community in New York, and they find themselves scattered, living among a lot of various kinds of Latino immigrants in many cases, and that it makes it harder to learn English, it makes it harder to have the kinds of personal connections that help people get settled and established in New York. Do you believe that's a problem? Well, it wasn't a problem for me when I moved, when I moved to New York, but it is true, I mean, you know, uh, People live in the tri boroughs scattered, but we do get together, you know, in the various uh, Ethiopian restaurants in the city, yeah. um, and also for you know concerts, um, and there are various churches in the city, and art shows and things like that. So. Now, when we searched Ethiopia on YouTube, we found a huge number of music videos. Let's watch part of one, and then we'll talk about the role of music in Ethiopian life. idea what this video is. It was not identified on the web, but the sound is a lot like the kind of music I hear when I go into my favorite Ethiopian restaurants and get a nice plate of injera with the red lentils and the yellow <laughs> lentils. Anything I can use my hands to eat so, yeah, is yeah. good this food is, I, me. You know, this is, uh, uh, you know, modern uh, music. I also saw it on, on YouTube, yeah. actually. Uh, but yeah, music is very much part of uh, our community, especially here in New York. The biggest names uh, um, in Ethiopian music scene always, you know, pass through New York. 
um, the Queen of Sheba uh, restaurant um, down in Midtown. Um, and we thank Queen of Sheba restaurant for referring us to you. Yeah, <laughs> and on, you know, on a regular basis, there is traditional Ethiopian uh, music there. Um, for I was there for, uh, you know, a, a Christmas time. There was a, a concert. And so, yeah, music is... Uh, Queen of Sheba at 10th Avenue and 46th Street, by the way. But does it play a role in the community other than entertainment, either here or in Ethiopia? Um, at least in the Ethiopian American community, it brings us together, and, and uh, you know, so that's all right. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you for coming in. I want to thank you for coming in. Thank you. And it's been a pleasure to meet both of you. And that's it for the premiere of our new series, Earth to New York. Next week, Venezuela to New York. Coming up in a minute, we will update the Sean Bell shooting investigation and take your calls on the Sean Bell case. This is Brian Lehrer live. Brandon. Listen, I know you're upset. But it was just one date. And dating's like the stock market. Uh, there's uh, ups and, and downs and, and, and ups. And so always buy low. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who would love to put up with you. This is CUNY TV, the City University of New York. Do you want to complete your college degree while balancing career and family obligations? Do you want a flexible schedule and a challenging curriculum? If you've earned at least 30 credits or an associate degree, now's your chance to finish what you started at CUNY. Learn about CUNY's online baccalaureate in communication and culture. Visit cuny.edu slash online or call 212-652-CUNY. This is Brian Lair Live 2007. We are here live Wednesday nights at 7.30 again this year, a year that begins with suspense about whether any police officers will be indicted in the 50-shot barrage in the Sean Bell case, a Queens grand jury is now in the process of making that decision. We will update the Sean Bell case and talk about some of the issues that are continuing to emerge from the deadly incident, and we'll take your calls. With me now are two guests, City Councilman James Sanders, who represents the Queens neighborhood where Sean Bell lived, and Edward Mamet, a retired NYPD captain and a frequent expert witness on police procedure. You've both been with me on the radio show. Nice to have you on the television side. Good evening. Welcome to the program. Good evening. Uh, Good evening. Councilman Sanders, the, the grand jury has now been impaneled, according to press reports. What actual crimes will they consider charging the police officers with? Oh, I'm not an expert on the, the crimes themselves that they would charge, but it, were they to ask my opinion, uh, I would charge them with everything from breaking, of course, the internal matter, breaking police protocol and procedure, but externally, I think that we'd even have to look at the, the charge of uh, murder, perhaps uh, aggravated or involuntary. Um, breaking police procedure, is that a criminal offense? No, that's strictly uh, administrative. That's a, it may be a violation of police department uh, practice, but that's not criminal. And in terms of possible aggravated homicide, uh, you know, accidental, how, however the, the... Well, do you want to say what you think they are considering in terms of potential charges? Well, they're probably considering the entire range of homicide offenses, which would <clears throat> begin from the lowest offense, which would be a negligent homicide, um, to uh, premeditated uh, murder, which is an extreme. I doubt whether it ever reached that stage, um, because as far as I'm concerned, this was not an intentional killing. It was um, not in their mind to kill anybody. 
What's the role of Queens District Attorney Richard Brown in this? The cliche is a DA can indict a ham sandwich if he wants to, even though it's the grand jury that makes the decision. Well, that's true, because the DA controls who the witnesses are, and the DA controls how the proceedings take place. Um, if the DA is really fair about it, is not looking to make a political statement, um, he, uh, the DA will consider all witnesses and allow the grand jurors to ask questions. That's how it works. Councilman, the, uh, the Bell family has called for the DA to be replaced by a special prosecutor. I know there's division among some of the leaders in the community as to whether that's necessary or desirable. Do you have a position on this? It's true that the mother and father of Sean Bell have called for it. Uh, I haven't heard that from my other constituents, uh, Nicole Bell and, and uh, the other, the Guzman family and other families. Uh, this is a tough spot for everyone. Uh, on one hand, the community is saying that we want a free and fair uh, investigation of this whole process and in that we're putting a lot of faith in DA Brown at this moment I'm going to go with uh, the question of faith with the with an article of faith and we are going to stick with uh, putting faith in the DA we truly hope that we will not be let down and uh, we are opening up the phones we can take any of your comments about the Sean Bell case and what you think should happen with the grand jury or any of your questions about some of the aspects of police procedure. We have a retired captain here, any of the uh, political aspects for the councilman, questions of policy, whatever, 212-251-0801, We all have too many phone numbers in our lives. Um, captain, I want to get back to this question of police procedure and what role following police procedure might play indirectly in the decision to indict because there are questions about whether the undercover officers involved follow the rules on how to identify themselves as cops whether they're allowed to shoot at a vehicle with no one firing at them and the three shots and pause rule these are departmental rules but there's violating them if they violated them make a criminal indictment easier to obtain? First of all, they're not rules, they're guides. <clears throat> There's no such thing as this three-shot rule. When I first uh, entered the police department, we had six-shot uh, revolvers, and we were trained to fire all six at one time, not take a chance and miss. The, the three-shot practice is, is just a, um, a technique that is taught to police officers, but it's not a rule. Uh, it's used really to um, conserve ammunition, not overfire and see if you hit your target. Um, <clears throat> as far as the not shooting at uh, vehicles, that again, that's a police department guideline not to shoot at a moving vehicle. Uh, it's kind of uh, strict, and I doubt very much whether I would restrain myself. <clears throat> if a vehicle were coming at me and I was trapped and I had nowhere to go, I wouldn't care about the police rule. I would open fire. Why is that a rule? Give us the context on that or a guideline, because it is a guideline. <clears throat> Commissioner Kelly confirmed it to me in a radio interview that that is a guideline you're not supposed to shoot at a moving vehicle in most cases unless somebody is shooting a gun at you from it. That's true and that's the national standard. There are several reasons. One is most of the time you fire at the vehicle you miss and you might hit an innocent bystander. Um, the most important thing is if you disable the vehicle, let's say you blow out a tire or you hit the driver, the driver is killed or wounded, the car will go out of control and probably um, may kill somebody or cause major damage. So that's the reason we're not shooting at the moving vehicle. And the guide is not to shoot at a moving vehicle unless deadly physical force is being used or, uh, <clears throat> from the vehicle, but not the vehicle itself. It's a complicated rule that a lot of police officers don't understand. I had problems with it. Let's take a phone call. This is Harrison <clears throat> in East Flatbush. You're on the air, Harrison. Hello. Yeah, hello. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, my my um, opinion about the whole situation is I felt like the police officers, they've been violating, um, I mean, the black community for a long time. I mean, as far as, like, if you go back to the history, how many shootings they have, they have broke. Uh, in this situation with Sean Bell, I felt like they violated a lot of um, police procedures. And I feel if we let the community, if we keep on letting them do that to 
to black people all the time like this is, is going to be a never-ending situation. Something has to be done. Like, the police department has to, you know, go over procedures with these police officers, that train them betterly or something, so th these things won't keep continue going on with our people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harrison. Councilman, how much do you agree with him? And, you know, depending on what kind of context you want to put this in, either there's a whole string of these kinds of incidents over years, Stansberry and Diallo, and then go back as far as you want, or, as Commissioner Kelly said to me on the radio, the police have 50 million contacts with civilians per year, and there are so few incidents that, in general, the police should be judged as a department extremely well. Well, I think that it has to be taken into context. Uh, I grew up in New York City, and I grew up hearing of incident after incident. Uh, with the problem that Where, we discovered... Up? What was your neighborhood? Oh, Rockaway's Queens, okay. the edge of the earth. Uh, not the, so far from where this happened. <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, the problem that, that my community is seeing is that everyone has a story of uh, either alleged police brutality or alleged police... Um, improprieties towards them, especially with young black men. Everyone has a story. If not themselves, they know of someone. So we feel that the, system, uh, that the problem is systemic. Now, I believe that it's a question of culture. The uh, captain and, my, and I have a, a background in the Marine Corps. And in the Marine Corps, we are taught to be bold, to control a situation, and to, to dominate a situation. Uh, the thing that stops us from running amok, if you wish, is that we are taught to have respect and there's uh, command and control. If CNC breaks down command and control, which I think has happened, then you're going to, you have the recipe of a disaster. And that's what I think is happening. There's a, a what culture. What do you mean command and control is breaking down? Kelly doesn't have control of the department? Well, we could look at Chief Izzo. We could look and see how uh, he wanted these units under his direct command and therefore moved uh, some other worthy uh, high-ranking officials out of the way so that he could command all of this. Now, Chief Izzo, of course, has the reputation of being called Tough Tony Izzo, and uh, he runs a hard-charging outfit. And that means that he's in charge and that he should go under these conditions. Captain. I have an idea what he's talking about. I, I definitely don't agree with him. Um, Commissioner Kelly's right. 50 million incidents, uh, 50 million responses or contacts a year is an awful lot. And I think I, I was telling you that the other day on the radio, that if you look at the number of police contacts per day in New York City, New York City has one of the lowest firearms discharge rates in the country. And we're a huge, it's a huge, I'm not in it anymore, but I keep saying we are. It's a of huge course. department. <laughs> Uh, and it's unfortunate that this has turned into a racial issue because uh, I think people are forgetting that out of, of the five police officers that fired, uh, two were black, one was Hispanic. Uh, the undercover was black, and he fired the first shot. Um, and, and to make it into a racial issue, I don't issue, think it was, it was an African American who fired the first shot. I think it, it was a Hispanic officer. What do well, you know? actually it was the white officer. But but well, the, the white officer fired the thirty-one shots. Yes, but not but, the first shot. Correct. But the question is, the, the the real situation is not whether it's black and white. Black people can be as prejudiced against black people as anyone else. I say that is it is a culture Wait, is among that really the police. True? Black people can be as prejudiced as against prejudiced, black people as anyone they else. They are as human as any other people out and we can be as 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 prejudiced as anyone if we're in an organization that prides itself in a certain uh, macho culture and that denigrates certain communities it's not simply the question of how many bullets are fired which which is horrendous nor how many uh, how many dis uh, weapon discharges it's a question of how many problems that we're having with uh, the CCRB, the Civilian Complaint Review Board, having a 98 percent dismissal of, of any investigations, uh, there's no place for uh, redress of grievances here. Kevin in Jamaica, you're on the air. Hello, Kevin. Yeah, good evening. Uh, my, name, my question is for um, the councilman there. Uh, the previous caller stated that it's been um, a problem that with the police dealing with the African-American uh, 
neighborhood. Now, my statement is, how is it that we want to change the mindset of a 50,000 entity when we ourselves can't change the mindset in our own neighborhoods? We are committing more crimes against each other, and the police department is only reacting to us the way we react to one another. So how is it that we want to change that smaller entity and can't change the mindset of the community itself? Council, Actually, the majority of black people, as well as white people or any other people, are quite law-abiding. The majority, the, the majority of police officers are fine officers and quite law-abiding. However, there are people who will break the law, whether they be in uniform or out of uniform. We are calling for one law and that everyone must obey it. You cannot break the law to enforce the law. You can't do any of these things. There must be one law. As a matter of fact, I'm actually leading a, a, a march for life in the Rockaways to combat uh, what some people are calling youth violence or black-on-black -black violence. Uh, so I, I understand the, uh, the caller. I differ with him. Um, that caller and other people like him who I've spoken to say, there is a disproportionate number of young African-American men winding up in these situations where they're at risk of having some kind of violent contact with the police, like being in an altercation outside a sleazy strip joint at 4 o'clock in the morning or whatever it is. Do you disagree with that? Well, uh, anyone could uh, strip joints are not the only places that people will find themselves in uh... it is it's quite legal in this country and it, even though we may differ it you certainly can be there now i think that this is the only community that must teach its young people how to survive an altercation with the police and i think that there's something sad about that uh, I think that there's something un-American about that, and we need to address that. We need to address it internally, and that's why I'm leading my, my demonstrations and, and workshops that I'm doing. But we also say that there must be one law, and you cannot break the law to uphold the law. Do you think it's a fair thing to say that if the same exact situation had played out, but those customers were young white guys, that it would have been less likely that a shot would have been fired? No, <clears throat> because I'll tell you, I'll tell you why. These, uh, you know, we've talked about contagious shooting. Contagious shooting happens any, everywhere, and it usually happens uh, when, when it's dark, and it happens when there are multiple police officers on the scene. Um, the phenomenon. But the first shot had to have been fired. That's the biggest issue. Isn't well, it? the first shot was fired, according to the accounts that I've heard and you've heard, by the undercover who says he was struck by the vehicle. And the medical examiner recently came out and said that Sean Bell had twice um, the amount of alcohol to make it um, illegal. He had a .16 reading. You only need .8, I believe, for a DWI offense. They haven't measured the cop's alcohol level, and he was very likely in there drinking too, right? Yeah, but that doesn't make it mean he was drunk. Look, I did undercover work for five yeah. years, and I've been in these situations too. You have to mix in with the people you're trying to um, nail. Um, so if you have a drink or two, that doesn't make you a drunk. No, but the shooting happened of unarmed people, and no test was done. A test was done on Sean Bell. Is that fair when you get into the legal arena? Well, the test wasn't done deliberately. I mean, he's dead, and when there's an autopsy, the, the, the blood is always tested. I mean, they didn't single him out for an alcohol test. And police officers are not like railroad workers and airline pilots. Uh, when after there's an event, they're tested. Now, that may come around as a result of this. I don't know. Maybe the councilman might introduce <laughs> legislation Absolutely. to have police officers <laughs> tested. But I can tell you one thing. If they do that, there's going to be a major fight with the unions. So be it. Can I, can I just ask one question? If anyone can point to an incident of this happening in the white community, uh, all of these incidents seem to happen in communities of color. I remember one community in Barrow Park stormed the precinct, uh, overturned desk. Not a soul was, was shot. Uh, I can't find an incident of this happening in any community except communities of color, especially the black community. Mr. Mann? I disagree. About uh, <clears throat> five years ago, Gidon Bush was shot and killed. He was a Hasidic Jew. 
Do you remember this in, in yeah, uh, I Borough remember Park? He was a disturbed man waving a waving hammer. Waving a around. hammer. <clears throat> there were about five or six police officers on on the scene. Can, see, can you name they, one more? Just they, one more. If I think hard enough, I will. But this is a case. It was all white, and he was killed. And how do I know about it? Because I was involved in that case. What 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 do you think? Um, Mr. Mamet, about the role of Detectives Union Chief Michael Palladino in this whole affair. He's been raising questions of what Sean Bell did for a living and saying Al Sharpton is trying to deny the officers their civil rights by staging a civil rights march. Is he a threat to police community relations, the way he's going about defending his members? No, no. I know, I know Mike uh, quite well. In fact, I've, uh, I may be, I'm a consultant to the Detectives Endowment Association. He's a Thank very, you for the full disclosure. He's a very good leader. He's doing what his membership wants. He's, he's, if he's fighting for them. Uh, Sean Bell's uh, work, I don't know if that, that, that really matters. But um, <clears throat> Mike is doing what any union leader would do. He doesn't want these detectives railroaded. And that's what's tr what Sharpton and his people are trying to do. They want to rush to judgment, and they want an indictment no matter what. And it's a win, it's a lose-lose situation. You want to disagree well, with that? A rush to judgment? Um, I think that the people of New York City, let's forget uh, the Reverend Sharpton, Reverend Dr. Sharpton for a second. People are focusing too much there. Uh, there would be no need for a Reverend Sharpton if there were not incidents of this nature. Uh, Reverend Sharpton didn't shoot anyone. He didn't force any of these things to happen. We should not focus there. We should look at the facts of the ground. Reverend Sharpton, to be honest, it has not called for the dismissal of the DA and is saying that the DA should have a free and fair investigation. Uh, I know uh, Mr. Balladino also. We're 30 seconds away from being done. Will this just come down to he said versus he said on whether the police officer properly identified himself and kind of hang on who the grand jury believes? If there's a free and fair investigation, we will come up with justice. If there is not, it will be justice tonight. Five seconds. Um, it depends on who the witnesses are and what evidence is available. All right. Thank you both. Obviously, this continues. And that's it for tonight's show. We're here live Wednesday nights at 7.30. Next week, Earth to New York, Part 2, Venezuela to New York. And don't forget to check out my daily radio show on WNYC 93.9 FM and AM 820, weekday mornings at 10. Tomorrow morning, your reactions to President Bush's Iraq speech tonight. Have a great night.